You are listening to Megiddo Radio. Megiddo Radio is a radio ministry of Megiddo Films. For more, visit our website at www.megiddofilms.org. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. This is Paul Flynn with Megiddo Radio for August the 23rd, 2014. Thank you all for tuning in. On today's show, we're going to be continuing on on looking at homosexuality and the dangers of it also the history of it a lot of the legalization of it often sadly the christian church has been largely anemic and inept to deal with how to look at homosexuality it's almost been kind of lessened in degree and how the church will look at it it doesn't look at it in terms of the way the Bible does. And we have to face this fact that it is a grievous sin. It is a a most serious sin. Not all sins are exactly the same. And sure, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all men have done wicked things that we all deserve hell. But all those who are in Christ Jesus are not do not face condemnation. They are not under the curse of the law anymore. That is all true. But the thing is, we have to face what the Bible says about the serious nature of homosexuality and all of their sin, uh, all of their sexual perversions. They are particularly grievous. And if you look at, if you study the history of the homosexual rights movement, going back to Harry Hay in the 1950s, after the research by Alfred Kinsey, I've got I have a lot to show you on today's show, and Lord willing, we'll be able to get through all of it. Um, there's been a number of publications, people who have researched uh, Dr. Judith Reisman, who do, who wrote this book I'm showing on the screen, Kinsey: Crimes and Consequences. Alfred Kinsey, for those who don't know, have never heard of him. He is the father of the sexual revolution. He was. Influenced greatly by Aleister Crowley, he was a sexual deviant. He, most of his research radically changed lawmaking, especially since the 1950s. When you think of the Model Penal Code in the United States, lots of his research has gone into uh, under our understanding now of legal cases. One of the main reasons why a pedophile or a pervert will only get sometimes months or a couple of years for molesting or rape or anything like that. Any of those kind of sexual crimes will only get one, two, three years is largely due to Alfred Kinsey's so-called research. Him and his associates from Indiana University, there's a, a group called today the Kinsey Institute, and they, from the 40s onwards, I think from about 48, when they started going, publicizing a lot of Kinsey's findings, and he went into jails, and he went, he basically got sexual deviants and used them as the normal population for his understandings of sexuality. They went throughout the country teaching, among other things, not just that homosexuality is is fine and natural, there's no problem with it, because it was seen as abnormal in the 40s and the 50s. It was illegal. It was frowned upon. And lots of the re- the research of Kinsey went on and led to um, the publication of Playboy magazine. Um, Hugh Hefner was influenced by him when he started the magazine in 1953. Also, Harry Hay left his wife, and he believed he had children as well, and started the gay rights movement. And we get into that later on. So it was a huge fallout. I don't want to just say that it's just because of this man's research. It is the judgment of God upon a nation. If you look at the end of Romans chapter 1. It is a spiritual battle we're in. And the thing is, what people need in the United States, across Europe, in Ireland, where I'm at at the moment, they need the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They need to be regenerated. They need to be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection spiritually they need to know christ they need to be in christ friend if you're listening to this and you may be homosexual you may be from all sorts of other backgrounds but if you do not know christ 
you will have to go into eternity and pay for your own sins, for all eternity. The thing is, you cannot pay for your own sins because the thing about it is, your sins are of infinite value against the one of infinite value. How would I put it? If you sin, if you, for example, have a crime against a king, a ruler of a very mighty nation, and if you do something or serious against him, it's much more serious against the king than it is just a regular um, citizen of the country. And you have, all, all of us have sinned against the one who's created the universe, the one who's outside of time, the one who's given us all good things that we've enjoyed, we have rebelled against him. So all men need to repent and trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, that no homosexual will enter the kingdom of God or anybody who practices the things that are listed from verses 9 to 11. person who is given over to a reprobate mind, someone who is a reprobate. Their life denies that they know Christ, even though people are claiming, like we were looking at last week's show, that they are homosexual Christians. It's not possible. I mean, a person might have a struggle here and there in different areas, but the characteristic fruit of their life is that they love Christ. They hate wickedness and love righteousness. They love the law. Look at Psalm 1. The, the man of Psalm 1 is the blessed man of Psalm 1, meditates upon the law day and night, and he loves it, and he, and he feeds on it, and he goes to the fountains of living water daily. Otherwise, his soul is famished. Another thing you can get on this issue, we're gonna, we're, I'm going to show you clips also later on in the show from this film, The Kinsey Syndrome, uh, which, is, which is a film done by Chris Pinto of Adullam Films. This, well, it's not actually Adullam Films, this one, but it is Chris Pinto anyway who, who made this film. I think it's called American History Films or something like that. Anyway, but he made this, it was produced by Christian J. Pinto, and I think Joe Schimmel was one of the executive producers also on this film. This is excellent. This is probably, there's a number of films on Alfred Kinsey. This is, in my opinion, the best one and the most comprehensive. It doesn't look at it from a morality standpoint. It, it may, at least, it quotes a lot of scripture in there and um, points out and interview one couple of, Wonderful interview showing the damage of pornography, how pornography destroys men especially, and women as well, uh, children, and so on and so forth. We're going to look at and continue on from, and we're going to finish it up really here, dealing with this issue, unless other stories present themselves. But I came across, there was a story back in July, if I'm not mistaken, in Northern Ireland, where a a bakery and now they're, they're, it's run by Christians, and a a leader of a local homosexual rights group went into the bakery and asked for them to write a slogan on the cake that they wanted, and they also put a a, a, a reference to a homosexual group promoting homosexual rights, etc. And they refused as they should have, because it was completely against what the Bible, they would be promoting it, making such a thing. But that is not allowed in, it would seem, in the United Kingdom anymore, where they, you know, and this is the problem with the whole idea of religious freedom, it doesn't really exist. What you get is secular humanism, or everybody, you see, the thing is, Biblical Christianity is diametrically opposed to all the other faiths of the world. The do what thou wilt mentality. Do what you want to do. Um, you have this inclination. Just accept you for who you are. Um, which, and the Bible says, our imaginations from our youth are wickedness. That's in uh, Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. So, the Bible says... Don't lean upon your own understanding, but trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
alone. Let's look at some of these stories. And you see, this ought to show people that it may seem to some that these people are just trying to, well, we're just trying to have a right. We're just trying to not be persecuted. We're just trying to live out our own lives and not bother anyone. This is the kind of the image they're getting and they're being forcibly persecuted. But the, the homosexuals, like just like the homosexuals in Genesis chapter 19, now it hasn't quite gotten to that level yet, where they're forcibly knocking down the door and saying, see these men that we've just seen enter, there were the two angels, but bring them out that we may know them. They wanted to rape them. It was very forceful. And there's another part of scripture also deals with that as well. And the thing is, when you legalize, when you legislate for deviant sexual sin, the people who are under God's judgment and are given over to a reprobate mind and their hearts become more hardened against the truth in their hatred of God, they will become more militant, they will become more aggressive, and they will not stop until they have destroyed every vestige of Christianity or any vestige of anything resembling moral virtue. They will. They won't stop until that point because that is human nature, unfortunately. Man has created an image of God, but he has fallen, and that that image is under darkness, is being with hell. Now men hold the truth and unrighteousness. We need the Spirit of God. And pray for these people as well. Pray for the people who are even making the legal case against this bakery. But let's watch from, um, this is from BBC uh, Northern Ireland. This evening, a bakery could face legal action for refusing a customer's request to make a cake with a slogan supporting gay marriage. The Equality Commission has written to Asher's Bakery Company. Its owner said their strong Christian views prevented them from being able to fulfill the order made by a gay rights campaigner. Michael Fitzpatrick reports. Support gay marriage. The words a customer who is also a gay rights activist wanted printed on a cake which they'd ordered from Asher's Baking Company in Belfast a number of weeks ago. They also asked for the logo of a local campaign group called Queer Space to be included alongside the Sesame Street characters Bert and Ernie. The customer wanted the cake for an anti-homophobia event hosted by the Alliance Party councillor Andrew Muir when he was mayor of North Down. After some consideration, Asher's Bakery refused the request to make the cake as they felt it was at odds with their religious beliefs. Six weeks later, they received a letter from the Equality Commission which stated that they had discriminated against the customer on the grounds of his sexual orientation. The company was founded in Newton Abbey in 1992. Its general manager, Daniel MacArthur, recorded a statement which the Christian Institute posted online. I feel if we don't take our stand with this here case, then how can we stand up against it further down the line? I'd like the outcome of this to be that any Christians running a business could be allowed to follow their Christian beliefs and principles um, in the day-to-day -day running of their business and that they're allowed to make decisions based on that. Gay rights campaigners are supporting the customer's discrimination case. The law is really clear on this. You don't get to pick and choose the customers. You don't get to pick and choose the people who use your services. If you're providing a service, providing products out there to the, to the wider population, you don't get to choose if they're gay or straight. You have to... So regardless of what they're asking you to do, what if... Um, let's use another argument. What if something was you see they see something is wrong this whole idea well equality I mean, there's no equality here based on the bible homosexuality is wrong and they wanted a slogan on that cake in order to support homosexuality well you don't get to pick you you serve the public no 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 how about they own their own business and if you don't like it go somewhere else I mean, what, I mean, what if um, somebody who says, oh, well, I have the right to um, look at pornography and all this kind of stuff. But what if they went and said, oh, we're going to put some obscene picture on the front of it. 
They said, well, we don't want, don't want to deal with that. Oh, no, that's, that's inequality to me because I have a desire towards pornography. How far do you take it? I have a desire towards whatever sinful desire that you have. You don't get to pick? No, God is the one who makes the laws. And it's better to obey God. I'm not sure exactly what the laws are in Northern Ireland, but whatever they may be, it is better to obey God than man. And the thing is, the homosexuals won't stop. And you'll notice it's getting more and more vocal, more and more... And I'm not saying that we should in any way become more aggressive back or anything like that. What I'm saying is we we stand firm on the truths of the, the word of God and we declare the word of God. We evangelize. If we see somebody is a homosexual, professing ho- uh, is a, and a professing Christian, we know they're lost and we need to evangelize them and sternly rebuke them and call them to repentance of this grievous sin. Let's continue in this uh, news report. Uh, accept the people here in front of you. In a statement, the Equality Commission said it has granted assistance to the complainant and will consider any response before taking further action. Michael Fitzpatrick, BBC Newsline, Belfast. Okay, so... And also, it was reported in another article that I was looking at from Northern Ireland that that will cost the taxpayers in the United Kingdom 30,000 UK or British pounds. 30,000. I mean, it, again, it, it's like it's becoming more red carpet treatment, and Christians can't say anything about this at all. And you see, the thing is, when you know, the same-sex marriage debate, I don't even like calling it marriage, that's not marriage. Marriage is one man, one woman for life in a covenant under God. That is what marriage is. God is the one who defines marriage, not those who would like to change all that. Now, the, and, you, and you can see with biblical examples that when, in, in all Israel, when the, some of the kings at different times removed the sodomites from the land. There was, it was a good thing to do. I think Josiah did it at one point. So, and we can see too, this homosexual agenda, and it's trying to get younger, younger people as well in, in schools, etc. and so on. So they don't want any opposition from Christians at all. They don't want to be told that sexual, uh, homosexuality is a sin. Now, I remember, if I'm witnessing to a homosexual, and I was a number of weeks ago, and I was giving out tracts, as we were with our um, with the church on Grafton Street in the middle of Dublin, and they asked me, well, what's your, what's your view of homosexuality? And just kind of, I could kind of see that they were looking for something to debate over or whatever, and I just went back to creation. One man, Adam, one woman, Eve. Sad thing is most a lot of professing Christians don't even believe in uh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And it really shows they don't. if you don't believe Moses, you don't believe Christ. It's all the word of God. And so I, I looked at one man, one woman. Anything outside of that is sinful and wrong. Anything outside of that. There is that comfort, that emotional support, that close relationship, that commitment, the physical contact, everything confined to marriage. Anything outside of it to someone who is not your husband or your wife is wrong and forbidden in Scripture. It is stealing. It is coveting after something that God has not given you possibly yet. But... Just like a fire, when it's in its proper place, can give you heat, warmth, and it is wonderful. But take it out of that fireplace, it will burn the entire place down. Sadly, people never learn that. Now, we'll just, uh, I'm also going to play a clip here from, this is from 
the uh, UK Parliament, which is in Westminster, and we just see what they debate about here. Uh, this is also on the bakery issue. The Northern Ireland Equality Commission is threatening legal action against a family-owned bakery because they wouldn't print a political message on a cake. The requested message was completely at variance with the company's Christian values. Does the Prime Minister agree that so-called equality is now being viewed by many as an oppressive threat to religious freedom? And does he further agree that such freedoms should be protected by the introduction of a conscience clause? I'm not aware of the specific case that the Honourable Gentleman raises, and of course I'll go away and have a look at it. But I do think a commitment to equality in terms of racial equality, in terms of equality to those of different sexes, equality in terms of people who have disabilities, or indeed tolerance and equality of people who make different, have with different sexualities, all of that is a very important part of being British. Democratic. Anyway, so, and, it, and it's true. There is no equality there at all. And, and it, see, the thing is, and I think this is another reason why I always say this whole idea of religious liberty where every religion can just do whatever they want, it is not biblical. If you ever had a Christian nation, for example, you wouldn't allow every all the Muslims to make loads of mosques and build loads of mosques everywhere. You... You wouldn't have the Roman Catholic Church. You would have, it would be seen as a blasphemy against God in a Christian nation. You, could, you cannot erect your idol worship, idols in, up to Molech or Ashtaroth back in Israel. It was illegal. But this whole idea, again, you, you can't find this in the Bible. You find religious toleration as in you're not going to force somebody to from the heart, because it doesn't work that way. You preach the gospel to them, you evangelize them. But they do not have the right to just practice their blasphemous religion in a nation that professes to worship Christ. If you have a nation that is truly a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, where they have, you know, uh, whoever's a magistrate, uh, Psalm uh, chapter 2, or Psalm 2, uh, verse 10 down to 12, and a couple other verses you could look at as well, that if you're going to have a Christian magistrate, he would have, well, if he was going to be magistrate in a Christian nation, he'd have to be a Christian. And you would have people going from the Bible where wickedness would not be tolerated, where the Ten Commandments would be the rule of the law. And I know people like saying, well, the second table, yes, but not the first table. What's happening here is there's a code of behavior that homosexuals have that is different to the Bible, and they want everyone, equality to them, equality in the secular humanist viewpoint is where the homosexuals get everything they want, and the Christians who are narrow-minded and bigoted have to go away, are nasty people. They are full of hatred. This is where it is leading. And this, it cannot exist in such a way. There is not going to be equality. There is either, and I don't want to put it like almost like one side's going to win or the other side's going to lose. It's not going to be. If you have anything, if you have Christian morals and values in a country, homosexuality will not be tolerated, as with other sexual perversions, all other ones. Anything outside of the, the, the marriage, outside of Christian marriage, if it even people having relationships outside of marriage, that would be illegal too. That is wrong. But this is a particularly grievous sin, and that can be seen in the Old Testament and in the New. For example, for those who may doubt that, it says in Romans one twenty six, for this cause. God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did choose. And he knows how he calls it vile affections, for even their women did, did change the natural use, unto which is against nature. And likewise also men, leaving the natural use of the women, burning in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which was unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of that error 
which was met. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispering, backbiters, haters of God. And these are all a list uh, right down to the end of the chapter, a list of a reprobate and somebody does not know Christ. Anyone who does not know Christ has a reprobate mind. If you do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a reprobate mind. Reprobate means to fail the test. You have not been regenerated. You do not rest in Christ Jesus. You, you are producing the fruit of your father, the devil. Now, we I don't think we have really time to look at the next a topic um there is a story but a couple Cynthia and Robert Guilford fined $13,000 this is a Chris, Christian couple were fined for refusing a lesbian wedding this is in the United States but we don't have time to look at that here because I want to get on to the next part which is like the homosexual agenda I think we can see it more and more and I think most people are probably like, who are not Christians, I mean, are kind of like, well, we just let them do what they want. It's not going to affect Christian marriage in any way. But the thing about it is, if it is just between any two people, then you've got a problem. Then you've got a redefinition of marriage. And what's to stop three people getting married, four people getting married to each other? The problem is marriage becomes redefined. It's not an issue about... Why are you stopping? And this is always the question homosexuals tend to ask in debates. Why are you against two, two men, two women, whatever, who quote-unquote love each other getting married? The thing about it is, they're not getting married. Whatever you want to call it, it is not a marriage. It is an abomination. It is not marriage at all. Again, it's like calling it a square circle. It doesn't exist. So it is not marriage, and it's a, an abomination. It hasn't been brought together by God. It is, these are vile affections, as Romans chapter 1 tells us. We are told that these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. And this is the kind of response that we need. We need to warn these people. Like, if you are a homosexual listening to this, you need Christ. Look, there are many homosexuals who have come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and through the power of the Spirit of God, working in their heart, giving them new affections, they have left behind their um, depraved, na- they have left behind their sinful past. And many of them, some homosexual men, etc., got on and got married and had lots of children and have wonderfully happy marriages. That is the power of the Spirit of God. Regeneration. When a dead man, dead in his trespasses and sins, is made alive, made a new creature. Regardless of what you're in, friend, you need Christ. Cry out to him today. Because I, I know people emailing me and back and forth talking about different things. And over the years, I've gotten different emails from different people. And they think, because I remember back in 2009, for example, with me, one of the lowest parts of my life was early 2009, before I became a Christian, before the Lord saved me, before the Lord had mercy upon me. And a lot of people, when they come out of, say, dark periods in their time, maybe they're not drinking as much anymore, or they're not as depressed anymore, and they think, well, we've come out of that, whatever that is. If you're not in Christ, you have nothing. You have this temporal life, and you are rejecting the one who's breathing, who's giving you the very breath in your lungs right now. I implore all who do not know Christ to throw themselves upon the mercies of a, of a Savior who is willing to save all those who will come to him. And I think that is the important thing. This is a spiritual battle, and we need to cast down all imaginations that are raised up against the knowledge of the truth as is talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. Now, getting back into Kinsey and the, the homosexual agenda, 
is not complete and you won't understand it unless you look back to the history of the 1940s, 1950s, Kinsey's research. Modern day, uh, an article came out on, when was it put out? It was put out on the 5th of July, 2014. This is in light of, you know, the Jimmy Savile cases and Ralph Harris and a number of other prominent celebrities being, you know, found out to be pedophiles, pervert, doing things that are grievous. Um, Andrew Gilligan, who did some, re- did some investigative research piece on a, a talk, a D- DSM-5 talk, which is um, looking at classifications of sexuality back in July of 2013, which happened in the University of Cambridge. We're going to look at, I don't have, I haven't been able to find the lectures. I don't know if anybody's ever published it or put it out anywhere, but people have written about it. And Andrew Gilligan writing about this presentation, which says, pedophilic interest is natural and normal for human males. Said the presentation, at least a sizable minority of normal males would like to have sex with children. This is the presentation. This is disgusting. But this is the direction it's going. Now, I'm calling the direction it's going, but this has been happening. This is de- directly tied in with the homosexual movement. It is all a normalization of sexual perversion to get us to accept it. Back in the 70s and 80s, there was a pedophile liberation movement that I've been just doing some research on. I found out through Tim Tate, who did a documentary back in 1998 for Yorkshire Television. And in that, he well, he was doing an interview with Chris Pinto. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to look at that later. But Tim Tate was talking about that, that they were trying to publicize and trying to promote the idea of, a lot like NAMBLA in the United States, North American Man Boy Love Association. And these groups really exist. Now, the um, Pi is the name of this pedophile group that existed back in the 80s. And they were on television and they were on doing interviews and saying how it's natural. It doesn't affect the children. It's not traumatic for them. They're sexual from a young age, etc. The same research that made the homosexual movement possible from Alfred Kinsey is the same research, quote-unquote research, it's fraudulent from start to finish, is the same research that made the pedophile movement possible. And there are journals with academics writing. There's a journal in Holland called Bidika that promotes this kind of filth. And the thing is, once there is no rules, they've thrown off the Bible, Ten Commandments, doesn't matter about Christian marriage. This is where society is going. It will descend into further and further perversion I mean, further and further normalization of sexual perversion. And you see these people advocating, and you can see them. There was a few cases in different governments across Europe of trying to lower the age of consent, sometimes as low as 10 years old. So this is not in a vacuum, and this did not start last year. And again, they're there, and they, this is a... a a talk that took place in July 2013. It's only being reported on now, really, in in some of the prominent newspapers, of talks such as this. One of the presentations was called Liberating the Pedophile, a Discursive Analysis. Another, uh, another title was, uh, I find it really hard to read this stuff, to be honest, Danger and Differences, the Stake of Hebophilia. No, anybody, no, I've never heard of the term hebophilia before, but it is the sexual preference for children in early puberty, typically 11 to 14 years old. And these, there has been an effort right back since the Kinsey Institute, not only to say that homosexuality was okay, but also to say that pedophilia, hebophilia, whatever you want to call it, was all right as well, that it didn't, it was consensual, all this kind of nonsense. But there was movements going back, and even Harry Hay, the founder, and hopefully we'll get a chance to look at that in a while, Harry Hay, who started the gay rights movement, 
You used to have a t-shirt, on the back of the t-shirt it says, Nambla walks with me. The founder of the movement tied it, homose- the homosexual rights movement, directly in with pedophilia. He did that. So, and I know most homosexuals will, there's a lot of, it depends on the statistics you look at, um, some homosexual magazines, like the Gay Advocates, say that 21% of homosexuals involved in pedophilia. All the way up to, if you look at, and all the way up to 70% in different studies. These are what different studies have reported. Much higher than heterosexuals, but I don't even know necessarily what this, but it's hugely, like if the, if the homosexual publications are even saying 21%, that's a very high number, and it can go right up to 70% with other even homosexual um publications. We'll look at some some of the research Dr. Jude Reisman has done as well. So this, again, I want to say this is not in a vacuum, but this is happening not among l- crazy left-of-center fringe elements. This is the University of Cambridge. Cambridge. And they go to, def- to discuss classifications. It quotes here also from... Tom O'Connell, a multiple child sex offender, who was an attendant of this in, in the University of Cambridge. And he's a longtime campaigner. He's part of that pie movement, um, the pedophile, pedophile information exchange. Um, I, don't think the group, no, no, I don't think the group exists any longer. But he stated the following. He was looking for legislation of sex with children. And he was at this meeting. Remember, this is academics from across Europe going to the University of Cambridge, and he says the following, Wonderful, he wrote in his blog afterwards, It was a rare few days when I could feel relatively popular. And th- again, I, I, I stress, this is academics. And this comes, and this is made possible from the research of Alfred Kinsey. And this difference is also... You can look into this here. It mentions uh, Ken in, in the same... Hopefully, I'll be able to put all these uh, in the show notes. Ken Plummer is an emeritus professor of sociology at Essex University and talked about the isolation. And this this is some of the things that is mentioned in Andrew Gilligan's uh, article about how... Well, this is not really in a, in a vacuum or anything, that this stuff needs to be dealt with, you could say. And again, another prominent academic saying, the isolation, secrecy, guilt, and anguish of many pedophiles. He says, he also goes on to say, the rights of the perspectives of pedophiles are not intrinsic to the phenomenon, but are derived from an extreme social repression placed on minorities. So he's saying the reaction from the public is extreme. And again, this is exactly like the Kinsey Institute. Now, we probably won't get a chance to look at all of this today, but this is the film you need to look at. And I rarely promote films, but if you want to do research in this area, the Kinsey Syndrome, you can get it on Amazon. I think you can also get it from uh, Dolan Films. And there's also a website, uh, www.thekinseysyndrome.com. There's also Dr. Judah Reisman's website. It's www.drjudahreisman.com. And type it into Google if you're not too familiar with... Um, the spelling Reisman is R E I S M A N R E S M I N, and um, she has a lot of articles on there dealing with this issue. And um, Ken Plummer, who was uh, basically emeritus professor, just retired. He says pedophiles are told that they are seducers and rapists of children. They know their experiences are often loving and tender ones. They are told that children are pure and innocent, devoid of sexuality. They know both from their own experiences of childhood and from from the children they meet that this is not the case. Again, the normalization of perversion. This is all this is. And when you give into it, when when the Christians have this anemic, lukewarm response of, well, we're all sinners. No, we are all sinners, but this is an incredibly grievous sin that not, should not be made light of. Ever! Now, all these people involved in horrendous acts can all be saved, come to the... Because we all deserve hell. 
We all fall short of the glory of God. But this is a particularly grievous sin. And you can read that article. It's called Pedophilia is Normal, a Natural Normal for Males. Okay, I want to look at a, another one. Actually, uh, before we move on, I just want to look at one more thing. Um, just want to look at one more attendee at this meeting. This is, again, in... And actually, this is actually the video I also wanted to look at. Uh, you can look at this on, on the Megiddo TV screen if you are watching this. Breitbart.com also covered covered the story broke by um, the Telegraph journalist Andrew Gilligan. And in Breitbart it says, another attendee, Professor Philip Chomovic of Doshi- Doshisha, I don't know how you pronounce that, University in Japan, it's a Japanese university anyway, stated in a presentation on the prevalence of pedophilia that the majority of men are probably pedophiles and hyperphiles. So he said this, adding that pedophilic interest is normal and natural in human males. This is the man who made the, the comment. And it's just absolutely disgusting and sick. Now let's look at... This is the, the video that was put up online promoting the, the conference. So let's have a listen to what it talks about, the aims of the conference. We want to look at all of it. So with our conference, we're hoping to pursue two aims. Uh, firstly, uh, we would like to explore uh, the revised categories of sexual normality and abnormality that the DSM-5 is producing uh, with speakers such as Patrick Singhi, uh, Alain Jami and uh, Liza Downing. Uh, and secondly, we want to also open up the debate towards wider critical questions about uh, social change around sexuality more generally. Uh, with talks about, for example, um, the, role, the way in which um, uh, ideas about uh, normal sexuality and abnormal sexuality are used today, are mobilized today in uh, controversies around immigration in France, for example, today, with a talk by Eric Fassin from Paris, or the way in which um, wider processes of gender assignment are operating in society today, for example, more precisely the way in which babies at birth are being uh, classified as either fi female or male, especially in those cases where this is uh, biologically not always very obvious, right? So we're very interested in also having speakers who will uh, talk about that more generally because the DSM will also have something to say about that and will sort of bring together the more specific contribution of the DSM to this question with wider critical analysis of the way... Just to also explain what the DSM-5 is, it is a document about you know, sexual normal. Well, it's not just dealing with sexuality, but it's dealing with large. It's basically the definitions of normality and abnormality by the American Psych Psychiatric Association, I think it is. Um, so this is a prominent document among psychiatrists in this area. In case you're wondering what the DSM five is, so they're debating normality. You know, say, well, here's the thing: if this ever changes, and the perverted ideas that they are putting forward, like the, the Japanese uh, professor put forward, what's going to change? If anything changes, it goes to more deviancy. It goes further and further away from God and his word. Which these practices have been evolving over the past, uh, over the past few decades. Uh, the conference will close with uh, a talk by Jeffrey Weeks, who's one of the founding persons of critical analysis of sexology in the UK, uh, who will give a very exciting talk um, where he will explore the possibility to go beyond classification. So he will basically ask, can we do without classifying at all? Uh, could we imagine a society in which we live, uh, in, in which there would be no sexual uh, labels at all? And if so, what would it look like? So as you can see, this will be a very exciting event, which will bring. Okay, now, again, notice how they're talking about, well, we're just going to talk about, you know, changing classifications, and, ooh, wh what if we go beyond classification? Yeah, you get people who are saying any kind of sexuality is fine, whereas the rules, well, there is no rules. 
What is normal? Well, we can decide. We can sit in a room and, and make up our minds. Mostly, and if you can see from some of the comments that have been made from people in attendance, that this is being decided by sexual deviants. As Alfred Kinsey was, as much of his staff were while doing the research, which involved, and this was exposed, it's in, exposed in the Kinsey Syndrome, the movie uh, Kinsey's Pedophiles, Secret History. Um, there's a number of different films and short documentaries and clips and things like that that exposed Alfred Kinsey that it was, and it's even acknowledged, right, that it the data to come to this conclusion was collected from pedophiles. And, and uh, several pedophiles. And this is even admitted by the Institute. This is accepted. And they covered up so much of the abuse. Actually, one bit of information that they got from f for using uh, Kinsey's book, Sexuality in a Human Male, published in 1948, and then 1953, Sexuality in a Human Female, was from a Nazi pedophile. I mean, it's astonishing. When you listen to the... See, the thing, if the Christian church ever waters down how it looks at this, it is following the advice of people who hate God. But at the same time, right, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And what they need, what you need, if you're listening to this and you're involved in any of these kind of things, you need Christ. You need his mercy. And you need to troll yourself upon the mercies of God. Repent and believe on him. Regardless of what the consequences are in this life, you will have eternal life in the life to come. Joy in your heart, unspeakable, because he will set you free from the bondage of your own desires, of your own will. There's another horrible, horrible story. Even, I don't know, it, it's, there's so many of these stories coming out. And I don't want to say this is new. Again, this goes back decades, and I want to show you this in a bit. Uh, there's a story here from The Telegraph, and it was, um, it comes from AFP. I think that's the Australian um, group for the, I think it's the Associated Press in Australia. I'm not too sure, but AFP anyway. Publish this. It's Australian judge probed for saying incest may be acceptable. Now, this is a judge. It says in the article, an Australian judge will be investigated for his appalling comments on incense, incest, in which he reportedly said sex between siblings was gaining social acceptance like homosexuality, authorities said on Friday. New South Wales State Attorney General Brad Bazard said he was extremely concerned about judge, district court judge uh, Gary Nielsen, who made these comments, alleged comments in the case where a man was accused of repeatedly raping his younger sister, which was reported in the Sydney Morning Herald. Hazard said the following, in my view, the community would be rightly appalled at the reported comments. He also says incest is completely reprehensible, unacceptable, disgusting, and criminal. That's what they say now. But what happens when they say, oh, well, you know, we were so backward. We were so... What if in 30 years' time they say, well, why should we stop incest? What damage does it do? I mean, if two people really love each other, you could use the same kind of argument for homosexuality. And they have used the same. What, if, what, what happens when that changes? What happens when that no longer is completely reprehensible, unacceptable, disgusting, and criminal? That's the direction that the fraudulent research from Indiana University at the Kinsey Institute and most what came from Kinsey. Kinsey, a man who died from, from self-inflicted wounds because of his own sexual deviancy, for goodness sake. And this is the one who the, the legal courts are listening to. No wonder... There are so many people in high-profile 
they're coming forward as um, sexual deviants. So that's another, and again, the, this is the direction p- certain academics, I don't want to say all academics, I don't want to say all judges, but a lot of them are. And a lot of it started with an addiction to pornography. Pornography will pr- produce this. It will. It will rob you of your joy. It will rob you of your life, and it will just suck everything out. And it will, it will blind you in a way you have no idea. This is from a documentary called Secret History, Kinsey's Pedophiles, and this will explain how we get to where we are. And it is not just about giving homosexuals rights. It is about removing all sexual taboos, it's about removing all sexual references to classification, etc. Everything goes. Because in Kinsey's own book, there's a table. I can't remember the exact table. I think it's table, I think it's table 42. Where there's actually a documentary called that. The, t- the children of, I think it's table 42, but I might be mistaken on the number. Where... Children as young, I think it's two months old, were abused. And it records it in that disgusting book. And this is what legislators are listening to with the model penal code that took place in the, that happened in the 1950s. That allowed a nation... It's, this is the judgment of God. Again, read the end of Romans chapter 1. For on many nations across the world. For the next three years, Kinsey corresponded regularly with Green. In 1948, he would publish large sections of Green's diaries in his first revolutionary book on human sexuality. But rather than presenting them as the claims of a self-confessed child abuser, Kinsey put them forward as the first ever scientific proof that children were sexual beings from birth. When, in 1948, Alfred Kinsey's sexual behavior in the human male became an instant bestseller, no one seemed to notice the contents of Chapter 5. In it, Kinsey reproduced sections of the pedophile diaries he had received from Mr. Green. First, and with no independent corroboration, he published verbatim Green's detailed descriptions of what the pedophile claimed were orgasms experienced by the hundreds of children he had abused. Now, for anybody who may have a weak constitution, or I just warn you, some of this is harrowing. This is extremely difficult to listen to. Um, again, the Kinsey syndrome, a lot of it's difficult, really difficult to listen to because it is describing crimes that are so disturbing. But I think in order to understand this problem, this must be understood. How do we get to where we are? You need. We, I think we really need to pull down strongholds, raise against knowledge of truth. This is one good one. But ultimately... We don't necessarily have to know the history of this. We just need to know from the Bible and have biblical examples of what happens, say, when homosexuals take take over or anybody else who's involved in any other kind of, whether it's incest, bestiality, or whatever else, what it happens when people with a, a desire towards that take over. What happens? There's biblical examples of that. Again, we should have the, the, the attitude of sola scriptura. Not that we need to depend on this, but this definitely explains why we are where we are. Extreme tension with violent convulsion, often involving the sudden heaving and jerking of the whole body, groaning, sobbing, or more violent cries, sometimes with an abundance of tears, especially among younger children. If you read 
So this is Mr. Green, he was called. That's not his actual name, but this was Kinsey's correspondence with um, this well pedophile, so child abuser. And this is where most of the data we get for... And again, this was... This, you know, when people say to you, oh, well, 10% of people are homosexual, that comes from Kinsey. A lot of this fraudulent data comes from Kinsey. Another thing I want to look at as well is... This is uh, from the movie, again, The Kinsey Syndrome. The Kinsey Syndrome. Now, in this film... There's a lot in this film. It's excellent. It shows the links between Alistair Crowley and uh, Kinsey in terms of influence. They didn't each know each other personally or anything. And um, actually, Table 34, yeah. Table 34 is the information, the crimes. Basically, crimes are recorded in Kinsey's own book. And this is a Pomeroy or, and all the other people who are behind, a lot of the people who are behind, went around the world after this Research was published by Indiana University, funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, for those who like to um, look into the tax-exempt foundations who funded this and wanted to destroy the, the, any semblance of Christian morality in the United States and in other countries as well. It, it, it swept into other countries. Now, but it was strongest in the 1950s and 1940s in America. Let's look at this. This is some of the research. And another thing that would show the, the connection between the perversion of homosexuality, which is what it is. It's a perversion of God's design for men and women. And it's linking with other sexual perversions. And this is from their own publications. This is Judah Reisman looking at, she's uh, just to explain what's going to happen in the video. She's looking at a homosexual dictionary with 12,000 new words. But I'll, I'll let her describe it here. The Queen's vernacular is, was considered to be the number one uh, gay lexicon dictionary for, for homosexual language. 12,000 words in this, in this dictionary. And you open it up, and uh, the, their, um, their mascot is, as was the mascot in The Advocate, a boy. Uh, Boy Scouts, in this case. And uh, the, the, the 12,000 words that are in here uh, all relate to the in, the, the, the in language, the, what, the cant that's being used within the, within the homosexual movement uh, amongst homosexuals. Uh, what do all these words mean? Well, they had a certain meaning for the homosexual world that, that the straight world didn't understand. It was it's another language. Very interesting because, you know, 12,000 words, well, when Webster compiled his American Dictionary to distinguish us from the English, that had 12,000 new words as well. So that we were distinct from, from the English, from, from Samuel Johnson's Dictionary. Uh, Webster said, no, we're a unique people. He had 12,000 words to show that. So this dictionary says, we are unique people. We have 12,000 words to show that. And some of those words we compiled in, in uh, we did an analysis of these words. And um, we found that the number one quoted word, the, the, or in order of importance, was a chicken, which relates to boys. Chicken, a young recruit, any boy under the age of consent, heterosexual, fair of face, and unfamiliar with homosexuality. There are 254 words there that deal with sex with boys. One of the most disturbing sequences in the film Chicken Hawk were a series of interviews done with parents whose children were being openly preyed upon in a small community by this. Again, another thing to show the greatest, uh, the number that was, or how do I put it? Not the number, but the, the word used the most was the word chicken. And you heard you read from there describing what it means. Also, we were mentioning about. Uh, I want to show a couple of clips from this film as well, and people can then decide if they want to buy it. But and I would would support publications like this, um, where uh, the, we'll just go to the th two minute and thirteen mark, where 
And again, this is incredibly difficult material to look at. But I think in order to understand where we're at and the severity and the the option of saying somebody can be a, in that line of thing. And look, there's there's so many churches now that are suffering from I'm not saying directly from this, but they're accepting sin in, and sin will produce uh, devastation if you accept it at all in any way, shape, or form. In a load of churches, you can find um, a lot of sexual abuse cases. Even in, like, uh, the in- I was looking at that case with uh, Jack Hiles and J- Jack Scop in First Baptist Church, Hammond, Indiana, and Chicago Magazine did a, a story about that showing nine cases now there's way more than that but showed nine of the cases that are linked directly in with Hans Anderson and some of these are some of the most heinous crimes you've ever heard of some people serving multiple life sentences afterwards Um, look up Chicago Magazine covering on uh, Hans Anderson and this is the fallout when we think in any way shape or form this is acceptable pedophile an extreme viewpoint. The reality is that their philosophy is embraced by leading members of the academic community in what is called... And the thing what I want to show you here is, remember how we were talking earlier about that meeting that took place July 13th, and you can look that up on the internet, Lord willing I'll have it up in the show notes, about, um, you know, the Australian judge, also about... um, the claims from that Japanese academic who's speaking at the University of Cambridge, how, again, that incense and pedophilia, all these things, are completely fine. They're natural. And that Tom O'Carroll character who was involved in the, in the pedophile group felt popular there, according to his own blog, who is a convicted child abuser. He's, he felt popular in the University of Cambridge. This is just to show you, this is not just a problem with the fringes of society, and I think people often think that, but this is a problem among academics who are pushing this, who are studying raw materials, either produced or they're training directly with Indiana University, and they're going teaching all the other centers about sexuality. They are learning from perverts. That's what they're learning from. They're learning from sexual deviants, sexual criminals. That's what they're learning from, from Indiana University and the Kinsey Institute. Sexology, the study of human sexuality. From the late 60s and early 70s, both in the U.S. and... Just that documentary we just looked at a minute ago, this is Tim Tate, who was the director of that. He was talking here, and he's talking about the, the pedophile groups in Britain... And uh, in the 70s and 80s. In the UK, there was what's called a paedophile liberation movement. And this put the notion, put forward the notion very vo- volubly, that it's perfectly all right for men to have, or indeed women, for adults to have, quotes, consensual sexual relationships with children of any age, which is plainly nonsense. But the paedophile liberation movement is still at work in America's academic institutions and includes men who design the thinking behind what is taught in America's sex education programs. You roll it down the penis, and that protects the man when his penis is inside the woman's vagina. There was never any science in all this. There's, it's got nothing to do with science. It's always been political. So, and the last bit I want to look at is this journal Paideka. I don't know if it's still in publication, but it was at the, make, at, at the time of the making of this. And I just want to show you, hopefully I still have it up there. Uh, Paideka is a journal which a lot of academics, I think American academics, this is published in Holland. Holland, which says, well, we don't have any crime at all. We have a low crime rate when it comes to sexual crimes. And I always say to people is, very simply, they make everything legal, so how can you have a cr- high crime rate? If you made everything legal in the morning, like murder, incense, everything else, well, you wouldn't have a high crime rate because nothing, is, nothing is, can be denied. 
the only thing that is the ruler is your own will, and you will do with that will. As Aleister Crowley so said. Paideke, the Journal of Pedophilia in the State of Purpose, and it just says in its statement of purpose, the starting point of Paideke is, is necessarily our consciousness of ourselves as pedophiles. Is our intention to publish an intellectual journal which will examine pedophilia within its cultural concept with emphasis on the humanities, history, and social sciences. We shall be speaking, therefore, only to, the pe- to pedophiles seeking a greater understanding of their identity, but also members of the academic community open to objective investigations of the phenomena. See, open objective. You know, like, we're, 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 re- we're re-looking at classifications. And what, like, just to quote the lady from... Cambridge University, what if we can go beyond classifications? It doesn't matter. And this is Kinsey. This is Kinseyan thinking. This is Alfred Kinsey, who, d- who took data from child abusers, wh- who had themselves, of course, a skewed understanding. And I hope everybody can see that of human sexuality. So. This is the last clip I want to look at here. This is at the 2 minute and 16 mark. Just to look at, it's just dealing with the academic side of it. Just to show you that this is not, make this larger here, this is not in any way a fringe phenomenon, unfortunately. They courageously affirm what they choose. They can say that what they want is to find the best way to love, an acceptable expression of God's will for love and unity. It may take people being arrested. Revolutionaries have always risked arrest. An interview with Paidika. In the Netherlands publication, Paidika, Hurt, and Dr. Hubert Kennedy, all out of San Francisco. Sorry there, I'm a bit trying to get this part in the DVD, which talks about Paidika. And uh, again, I think it ties in just showing how this is not a one time, there's a lot of academics involved in this. Each of these men have either been editors for or have appeared in the Netherlands publication, Paidika, the Journal of Pedophilia, a pseudo-academic journal specifically dedicated to normalizing and ultimately legalizing child molestation in society. Also appearing in Paidika was Dr. Ralph Underwager, who was often called as an expert witness in court cases involving child abuse. In his 1991 interview with Paidika, Underwager stated that pedophiles can boldly and courageously affirm what they choose. They can say that what they want is to find the best way to love, an acceptable expression of God's will for love and unity. It may take people being arrested. Revolutionaries have always risked arrest. As alarming as this is, during our investigation, we were surprised at the number of people who seem to accept the pedophile philosophy. And how do you And this just shows you this is again apologies for some of the things being said here, but I think it's pertinent to this investigation to show what people that this is way people are normally thinking now. It is being more and more normalized perversion. In society, across the board, whatever you want to mention it, whether it's homosexuality, pedophilia, bestiality, all that, it is becoming more and more normalized. Incest has been on the television. This is the agenda. How do you feel about the issue of child pornography? I kind of think that uh, it probably doesn't make sense in the same way that nothing else makes sense, but unlike a lot of people who just have this visceral reaction to it, I kind of feel like if people are having sex and if they just want to do it, you know, openly, uh, it really shouldn't make a difference what age people are. It's our strict laws that result in uh, so many of these kids being killed by child molesters because they're so afraid of what would happen to them if they get caught. It's a direct result of our stringent laws. I mean, uh, I think uh, everybody's got to be broken in somehow, you know, and ever since the dawn of man, it's been a normal thing where uh, people, when they're young and don't know anything, get broken in by somebody. If they're older, a private institution. Today, the two leading institutes that promote pedophilia are the Kinsey Institute in Bloomington, Indiana, 
which receives more than $700,000 a year in taxpayer funding. And in San Francisco, the Institute for the Advanced Study of Human Sexuality, a private institution founded by Kinsey's homosexual lover and co-author Wardell B. Pomeroy. We could look at countless other details in this. This is a really disturbing and sick case. But the thing is, I remember reading on last week's show, the Jars of Clay frontman, who claims to be Christian, says he, in a tweet, this is I think from a couple of years ago, I think it was back in 2012 if I'm not mistaken, saying that he doesn't see the argument for a slippery slope. It's not a slippery slope in some ways. This has always gone hand in hand. Harry Hay, the founder of the homosexual rights movement. Again, sexual perversion goes hand in hand with all other forms of sexual perversion because they argue for one thing, then they argue for everything else once they get that. They will not stop until it's all been legalized. Maybe not individuals, but the movement as a whole. And Harry Hay had in the back of his kind of T-shirt kind of thing as he was marching that NAMBLA marches with me. March, uh, NAMBLA walks with me, sorry. That is the quotation on the back. NAMBLA, North American Man Boy Love Association. The Kinsey Institute promotes pedophilia. Kinsey promoted pedophilia. It was from Kinsey's research that the homosexual rights movement came out. It's in Kinsey's research that so-called soft porn uh, empires like Penthouse, Playboy, all these kind of groups started. 1953 onwards, uh, Hugh Hefner read uh, Kinsey's work and started Playboy. And then Hugh Hefner became somewhat of a pamphleteer of the sexual perversion, per promiscuity, that was promoted by Kinsey, a sexual deviant. Basically, we are following the advice of what was seen as the perversion of their generation, claiming that, well, everybody was doing this, and it included even abortion, et cetera, and so on. So people were doing this in large numbers, and if you actually jailed people for doing these things, then most of the population would be in prison. And what's really to blame is their stringent laws. That's what leading to, that leads to these murders. And you heard it there from the people in the street that Chris Pinto and his film, The Kinsey Syndrome, was interviewing. And I just want to read, before we finish the show, The word of God is what we need. If you were involved in homosexuality, if you were involved in any other sexual perversion, or any other sin for that matter, or it doesn't matter, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, because it says those who will not, and those who will worship more the creature, or the creator, rather than the creation, God will give them up. Verse 24, God gave them up to uncleanness. He says, you want this? He'll give you over to it. And that is a judgment of God because it says in Hebrews 12, 5 to 8, those who he chastens, those who he chastens, those who he disciplines, those who he smites in his heart and makes them feel horrible for what they've done against God, those are the ones he loves. It says that in, again, Hebrews 12, 5 to 8. A loving father corrected, correcteth his son. Romans 1.26, for this cause God gave them up to vile affections for even their women. Again, this is people who withhold the truth and unrighteousness. There's different judgments. Not everybody's completely the same, but this is a characteristics of a reprobate mind who do not know God and reject the truth. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections and even their women to change the natural use of their what which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the women burning in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving themselves the recompense of their error, which was met. And I just want to, and it quotes a number of other things. God gave over to a reprobate mind, verse 28. Verse 30, backbiters, haters of God. This is a reprobate mind. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, children who do not dis obey their parents. That's a sign they do not know God as a characteristic fruit of their life. Do they obey your parents? Do you obey your parents? Um, I mean, you will be regenerated and want to obey the laws of God. So there's a fruit of, you have to worry about your children if they're not obeying you. 
without mis- mis- without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing, they know, who knowing the judgment of God, that that which commits such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them. And that is the characteristic of today. The judgment of God. Repent and trust upon God who is ever merciful. Whatever you've done, Christ's blood is sufficient to wash away all the filth of your sin. Trust and believe Him today. Do not believe the testimonies of liars, of perverts, and criminals who want to destroy every vestige, every part of the image of God in man. May God bless you all. Talk to you next week.